And so just as we switch over, I'd like to introduce uh, the three speakers who are going to be joining us. Uh, what we're going to do over the next hour is have a few uh, global case studies and uh, of local examples uh, of broadband and how broadband is being deployed in rural communities around the world. Uh, so our first speaker will be Anne-Marie Lapinen. Her bio is in your package. Uh, but she is, the, uh, she is a project manager in Finland and, uh, and has been uh, working with the, the City Council of Kalkilki. Uh, excuse me for my assuredly improper pronunciation of the city. Uh, but she's been engaged in, in leading a rural broadband deployment project uh, there in Finland, so we'll have the opportunity to hear an actual on-the-ground case study. Uh, we also have Chris Condor joining us uh, from the UK, and uh, she's one of the founding members of Broadband for the Rural North, and if you remember, Catherine Hilton uh, mentioned BR4N in her presentation yesterday, uh, and it's a very grassroots organization from uh, the, northern, the uh, northern UK and Lancashire, and uh, so you'll hear a case study from there. And then, uh, not in your package, but uh, we're very grateful to have him joining us today is Corey John. And Corey John is the Executive Director of Connected 10C, uh, which is part of the, uh, the Connected Nation initiative in the United States uh, to, to deploy broadband throughout uh, all of the US. Uh, and so you'll hear how that kind of federal initiative is playing out in, uh, in, a, in an individual region's context, uh, in this case, Eastern Tennessee. And so we're very grateful to have Corey join us uh, as well. Okay, thank you and thank you for asking me to join you. Um, greetings from Finland. It's late afternoon here, probably black outside, but I guess it's morning over there, so <laughs> good morning in that case. Um, I don't know what you have heard about me, but um, uh, I work for a development agency in Western Finland. I used to work for Finnish Parliament for five years, and uh, five years ago I changed to the to the world of fiber networks. And this April I changed from uh, FDDH network to development agency to work in that broadband project. And um, I'm really interested interested on. Um, regional networks and especially their possible ability to serve remote areas. But uh, do you see my graphics over there? This picture of scenery? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Just checking if you are still awake. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Um, this I wanted to show this picture because it shows you what kind of region we have over here. So it's basically forest, 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 fields, and a few houses there and here. So it's very, very remote. But um, let's dive into the picture and see what it has hidden underneath. Uh, a few words about the region itself. The region is about 5,000 square kilometers, and the population is about 44,000 altogether. Uh, it is spread in a way that there are municipalities where the density, average density, is about three people per one square kilometer. So there are really no neighbors around. And then, of course, there are bigger municipalities that have about 10 average density. We have about 60 villages with, with 15 to 5,000 people per village. And then we have eight municipality centers in this region. A few words about the background. Uh, in 2004, we had the situation in my region that over half of the villages didn't have any kind of broadband connection whatsoever. And none of the national companies, national telecoms, were willing to invest in the area, which kind of makes sense when you think about the density. And at the same time, we got first first information about their plans to start to actually literally take away the telephone lines, which also meant that ADSL connections were no, no longer 
how possible. And this is what they have done. They have literally taken the couple away. Um, also, the local municipalities, they started calculating how much money they pay every year for national telcos for every ADSL connection, every every daycare center, every school, and so on. And they found out that the amount was pretty high. So, uh, when, with these two situations, the municipalities tried to figure out new ways how to deal with this, and they wanted to cut costs, for cut costs, but also make the region better and more vital. Um, so, because of these situations, um, the municipalities decided to found a limited company called Subo and Silverware. It's a nice nice Finnish word. It means regional network of, of Suhoja region. And it was uh, founded by six municipalities and they are the owners. The purpose of the company is to build and maintain and operate so we actually do maintain ourselves the network. We, uh, there are no national telcos doing it for us. We do all the configurations of the bridges and so on. But we do not provide any services. I will have more information about that later on. Uh, more figures, we have over 2,000 households and businesses with fiber to their home. And the length of the, of the network is about, it's a little less than 2,000 kilometers, about 1,500. And the capacity of the backbone is 10 gigabits per second right now. So what do we have since, or what, what is the uh, output of this company? Right now, all the public places, such as schools, hospitals, etc., they have fiber connection and they form one big secure internet. Uh, in addition, all the villages in the area, they have fiber to the home network, and anyone in the village can join it, little cottage or big company. And actually, there are many customers and many farmers right now they are using 150 megabits symmetrical connections right now, and it is 150 megabits. It's myself, I have 100 megabits symmetrical, and I would never give it up. Yeah. Um, the connections, the, the connections, what people have, it's, it's, there are people who have one megabit, even though they have fiber, they still want to only have one megabit. But um, they could have all the way to 1,000 megabits per second. Uh, right now, only the municipalities, meaning schools and city halls, they have 1,000 uh, 1, megabits. But uh, I guess there are not so many services yet that would require 1 gigabit, even though even there are not so many services that require 100 megabits right now, but I'm pretty confident that in five, ten years there will be such services. Um, we do have actual proof that have come from the municipalities and from city mayors that uh, there are people who have actually moved back to the countryside because of the network. Uh, they can do, for example, remote work from home. So it is it is not just nice words, it's actually fact that this has happened in my region. Um, we do have regions uh, or areas with poor TV quality. And, and uh, when uh, Fiber came to these houses, they were able to uh, purchase IP TV services, meaning that the TV signal, the signal comes through Fiber and they are no longer dependent on terrestrial uh, TV signal or, or heavy snowstorm or such things. Um, there are a lot of uh, words being said about 3G and 4G. Actually, my view is that these two things are not rivals. They are, they, uh, 
complete each other in a way. There are services, for example, myself, I have fiber at home and I use 3G when I'm on the road. So they are two things, two different things for different uh, demands. And actually, after we got this fiber to the home network, uh, national 3G and 4G telcos have uh, bought bandwidth and black fiber from us. So actually our network has improved the wireless coverage. Few pictures so that you are not too bored over there. Um, this is a um, normal uh, situation. As you can see from the background, it's middle of nothing. Even the road is sandy and not asphalt. Um, we mainly use trenching, so we trench the table directly underneath the ground. Uh, this is a picture of a um, village center or, or data center. This is really new. Actually, it is one month old, so as you can see, there are not many customers attached to this center yet. But there are some. Um, this is a picture of, uh, from the household. There are two boxes on the wall. The right hand box is the box where the fiber is welded into. And then there are those yellow connection fibers going to the residential gateway. And from there begins the house's own intranet. This is actually the only, only time I have actually uh, assembled this gateway. So I'm really happy, as you can see. And it still works, which I'm really proud of. <laughs> oh. uh, this is just to demonstrate uh, home entertainment. Um, there are a lot of iPads nowadays. There are a lot of um, laptops, IPTV, and so on. So it's actually something, it, it brings something for the whole family. Uh, this is a picture of um, telepresence devices. Actually, the picture on the right hand is the device I'm using right now. Um, on the left hand picture, this is from another municipality in my region, and the guy actually on the, on the picture there is physically in the Finnish parliament in Helsinki in that picture. So we got a um, phone call or a telepresence call to the parliament in that picture. And this is really widely used. Uh, all the city halls, their telepresence devices are attached to the, the intranet. So every time they talk to each other, it's the signal goes directly from city hall to city hall. It doesn't have to go to Helsinki and back or like that. Um, this is a picture from schools. We have interactive smart boards used in the schools. So no more classical, classical um, glass boards. These are smart boards with, um, it's like a big um, iPad. Uh, screen where you can actually write and draw on the picture and then you can save. For example, in the picture there's a castle and the guy has drawn some lines, green lines, so you can actually save this image and then use the next day or the next week or the next year. And the students really, really like this new technology. Uh, about Open access. I uh, earlier I mentioned that we we maintain and we build and we operate, but, but we do not provide any services. I know there are a lot of different versions of open access, and I know that telcos, commercial telcos, do not see the situation as I do. Uh, but in our network, the type of customers. Um, they are totally free to choose and change the service provider. There are six different service providers right now that they can freely choose from. The normal situation everywhere else in Finland is that if you have national telcos fiber, you, that's the only service that you will also get. So it's a monopoly. But in our case, uh, it's, it's not a monopoly. It's they have a choice. And the service providers, they do not 
rent the vehicle. They do not rent bandwidth from us, the network owner. And they do not pay anything for the network. They are actually given the possibility to, to carry their VLAN, uh, this virtual global area network, through the network for free. And this is something which usually is the audience uh, thinks that this is something different, that they will actually not pay anything for the network. Uh, I have, an, in the next picture, I have kind of like a cash flow, so hopefully you will understand better how it goes. But because of this, um, this situation that the service providers do not have to pay anything for us, uh, it really can be seen seen as a free competition. There, for example, the cost of 100 megabits per second connection decre decreased over 20 euros when new service providers entered the network. So right now, for example, um, I have a little error. It's 150 megabits symmetrical connection. What does the household pay is 24 and 60 for the network, meaning my company and then 22 euros for the service provider. So for 150 megabits symmetrical connection, the customer pays about 46 euros per month. And uh, this means that the service providers, they don't have to invest, they don't have to build their own cable. They can concentrate fully on the services. And all the service providers are on the same level, no matter the size. About the finance, um, about 10 million euros so far has, has been invested. About half of it are bank loans, and the other half are uh, either regional, national, or EU fundings, or then other meaning uh, we have sold flat fiber, we have sold capacity, and so on. And this amount, this 10 million, of course, naturally is, is only what can be invested, not the everyday expenses. And the bank loans that we have, uh, they are always guaranteed by the municipality where the investment takes place. So the municipalities do not give any, any direct money for us. They only guarantee the loan. And it's then our job to make the cash flow positive so that we will be able to pay back the loans. Um, this figure hopefully clarifies a little about the, ca the cash flow. We have four different types of cash coming in. First of all is the fiber to the home connection purchase price, meaning that when the household wants to have um, fiber to the home, they have to pay one time cost, which is about 1500 euros. And this cost goes totally to the building costs. As you probably know, the, the civil works are, are the most expensive part of the, of the connection. Um, <coughs> then, like I mentioned, we sell black fiber, we sell capacity, and we use this amount to the investment. And then there are the monthly network data. Uh, there's a lot of noise coming from over there. Are you still there? Yes. Yeah. We're still here, yes. <laughs> Just say that again. We're, Hello. We're, we're still here, Ed Marie, yes. Can you hear us? Okay, good. Very good. I thought you were kicking me out. <laughs> okay, so well, well, thank you very much, Anne Marie. Uh, we're going to um, switch to our next speaker, Corey, and come back for questions in, in a few minutes, if that's okay with you. Okay. Okay, excellent. Okay. So, uh, our, our next speaker is Corey Johns, and uh, Corey Johns is joining us from Connected Tennessee. Uh, so, we'll bring uh, him on board here.
Corey, we can see her speaking now. We, we can't hear anything. It helps to take yourself off mute first. There we go. <laughs> uh, we're all here to talk about technology. It's great when, uh, when, when we actually know how to work the technology and, and remember to do little things like unmute ourselves, right? So, uh, well, thank you. I just wanted to say thanks for the opportunity. It's a, it's a pleasure to join you this morning and, and be part of a, such a prestigious event with affiliated with such a prestigious university and to join with some uh, international uh, colleagues from, from across the pond as well as, as here on this side of it. Um, my name is Corey Johns and I'm the Executive Director for Connected Tennessee. Uh, we are uh, Tennessee's state broadband initiative in the United States. And um, we're uh, working through, uh, I guess, the kind of best way to present some material to you. So I'm, I'm gonna switch off and toggle to a couple of presets here and. Hopefully uh, that will enable you to better be able to see a little bit of my presentation. How how is that showing up on on your side? Can you can you see what's coming across the projector screen fairly legibly? Yes, we can. We're we're just maximizing it. Right okay. Now. Great. Well, I want to touch on just a few things of, of what I'd like to touch on today, and um, it's uh, I realize we we have a brief time and. and Sometimes it's more difficult to, uh, to, to scope for a 15 minute presentation than it is for a 50 minute presentation. So uh, I'll roll down through just a, a couple of these things that I'd like to highlight very briefly. And then at the end, I'd like to steer you to a place where you can obtain uh, more information uh, at, at your own time. Um, but in, in essence, Connected Tennessee is Tennessee's state broadband initiative. Uh, we are a, a not-for-profit not organization working in a public-private partnership with, uh, with the private sector as well as with uh, uh, state government, federal government, and, um, and uh, various uh, foundations. Or we seem to have a technical difficulty. Should we switch to the UK and come back? Okay. To our presenters, we just we have a technical difficulty. So I'm sorry. We, oh, we just got you back. Sorry, we lost audio for a moment. We can hear you again, Corey. Hello, are you there? We are here. Can you hear me? Okay. We can hear you, Corey. I'm not sure if you can hear us. Okay, uh, I hear you loud and clear. Perfect, okay. So, um, I wanted to touch on uh, initially just a, a couple of key elements of, of our model, and I should first say that we are not a broadband service provider, uh, and we are not a government agency. We are a third party uh, intermediary that works with both groups to, uh, to facilitate uh, the public-private partnership and basically pull folks uh, around the table collaboratively working on these issues together. So the three core components of our model I'd like to highlight are first the broadband mapping project. And, and I know that uh, regulatory environments are often very different, uh, particularly with some of the folks that you'll, you'll, you'll hear from, including, including Anne-Marie, the previous speaker. Um, in, in Tennessee, what we work to do is work with both public broadband providers, including uh, municipal or city utility districts, as well as uh, private providers uh, such as T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, and, and others. Uh, we work with them to, to aggregate their service territory information uh, into one comprehensive statewide broadband availability map so that we can see where the, the, the unserved areas are and, and also understand where more robust speed tiers uh, exists, uh, as well as where we're still having some challenges uh, addressing uh, basic connectivity needs. Uh, so I'd like to invite you to think of that first as the supply side, so where broadband access is, where the infrastructure presently exists today. Um, to understand the demand side, we do a lot of research, uh, statewide research, into both residential technology adoption and use, as well as business 
technology adoption and use to, to understand the consumer market uh, uh, more, more effectively. Uh, it's, it, many of you probably seen the movie Field of <laughs> Can you hear us, Corey? Corey, we lost your audio again. Can you hear us? This uh, adoption and use research uh, comes together in a community engagement program. Um, and, and as we have been working in this space for a, a decade now, uh, since Connected Nation, our parent organization, was launched, uh, this has taken some, some various different forms and we've learned some lessons along the way. And today it takes the form of a, a community technology assessment uh, that seeks to engage the relevant stakeholders in the community, whether they be from government or from business, from healthcare, from education, from libraries, or the agriculture sector, to pull together those, those key leaders uh, to do a comprehensive assessment of their local technology landscape. And the form that takes, and I'll touch on this in just a moment, is uh, our Con Connected Community Technology Certification Program, uh, which is a program that's designed to help the community better understand their strengths and their weaknesses on the technology uh, front, uh, but also if they meet certain requirements uh, and, and can uh, cross certain thresholds and establish benchmarks, uh, they actually can receive uh, a, a, a designation as a certified connected community from Connected Nation. Um, I understand that much of your conference uh, in looking at the agenda is focused on public policy, and, and I won't spend a great amount of time on this, uh, I, but I would like to call your attention to uh, some important reform efforts that are going on in the United States, and most notably that's the Universal Services uh, Reform effort into the Connect America Fund. Um, this is essentially a telephone tax. Uh, th this program has been in place for, uh, gosh, 80, 85 years, something like that, pre-Roosevelt. Pre um, and, and it was designed to subsidize uh, telephone build-out and operations into rural areas where the market may not support those costs otherwise. Um, that, for, in, a, in a historic effort, uh, about a year ago actually, the, the, the United States Federal Communication Commission uh, voted to reform a portion of that program into a Connect America fund. So for the, for the first time uh, in history, those universal service uh, tax, taxes that are coming in may now be used directly for broadband build out, uh, recognizing that uh, telephone is no longer telephone, it is now telecommunications. So uh, sometimes government moves a little slow, more slowly, and in this instance, uh, that's certainly the case, uh, but we're happy to see some of those, uh, those revenues being targeted toward broadband build out. Uh, also important is the FirstNet Public Safety Broadband Initiative, uh, and this is a nationwide interoperability movement uh, for public safety and first responders to migrate them to a seamless voice and data system so that in, in the event of an emergency such as Hurricane Sandy, that the various responders uh, may communicate with one another seamlessly, whether it be on a voice or a data platform. And the final thing I would like to wrap is just to tell you a little bit about what Connected Tennessee and what Connect, Connected Nation is doing in the education space today. That's really one of the promising frontiers that we see as we look ahead, and there's some really interesting things going on in that front. So. Forgive me, that's a, a bit of a lengthy uh, introduction, but I'm just gonna highlight a, a couple of things as we move through each of the, and, and mostly I want to call your attention to some, some, some of the validated research uh, of our model, and, and th this information is uh, current, this, this information is benchmarked from 2007 to 2010, which is the first three years of our initiative. I actually have new research early next year that we look forward to uh, doing a deeper dive into, but essentially through this supply side 
demand side and community engagement model. Uh, what we saw when Connected Tennessee launched in 2007 and then three years later is we saw uh, internet use and home broadband use that outpaced the national average during that time uh, by 4% to 28%. Uh, and, and outpaced the Tennessee average uh, up, to, up to that point by 9% and 35% um, annually. So since, since the launch of our effort, we, we have seen validated increases in broadband uh, availability and, uh, and adoption uh, at the home level. And, and that's something we're very proud of. Uh, when you get into some of the demographic groups, and I know that a lot of your conference is focusing on rural, so I'm going to start with that. Uh, you'll see uh, to the right of the dotted line there, uh, the, the fourth uh, column, uh, internet use among rural Tennessee residents uh, outpaced the, the, the national average by, um, by 13%, and uh, home broadband use increased uh, more than 60% above the national average uh, during, during that time. Uh, other significant groups that saw uh, in increases in adoption rates included elderly, low-income households. You'll see a 133% increase in home broadband use over that three-year period. And among, t among minority communities in Tennessee, 113% increase uh, over that time. I, I would like to call your attention to uh, th this benchmarks not only connected Tennessee, but also our sister program in, in the, the state of Ohio. And uh, what this looks at is uh, from 2008 to, to 2010, um, Tennessee was essentially at 49% home broadband adoption, and Ohio and the United States on a whole were at about 55%. Uh, two years later, Tennessee had increased their home broadband adoption rate from 49% to 58%, while Ohio, who started out uh, at the same place as the national average, 55%, increased to 66% household adoption, while the national average at that time only increased from 55 to 60%. So I, I think it is important, and I understand that with the, the uh, focus on rural a lot of the challenges are going to deal with infrastructure but it's also important to uh, focus on uh, a broadband adoption and broadband use and the importance of moving uh, more adopters in, in, uh, uh, into the market and moving more um, residents across the digital divide um, I'd like to spend just a few moments showcasing the interactive mapping tool, uh, and this is called My Connect to View. Uh, it's Tennessee's interactive broadband map. Actually, I actually have this uh, preloaded here, so I'll pull this up. I'm not sure how well you can see that on your end, but it's, it works very much like uh, Google Maps or Bing Maps, any other GIS-based mapping platform. You'll see that when you uh, gives you an option to, to enter an address. And, and what that will do is enable consumers and residents to search any address in the state uh, to see their uh, broadband provider options at that location. I'm just gonna put in our office address and let you see a little bit of how that functionality works. So it, First finds the location and then pulls up all of the very providers uh, who are serving or who are providing broadband access to that location. You can click on any of these uh, and and it will take you to uh, the, the company's website. Um, so it's a very powerful tool in uh, helping uh, residents better understand their broadband options at their at their home location so that they can make uh, wise consumer choices. Um, I would like to also, I wanna scan back out for just a moment and show you some of the, some of the cool uh, features as well. And, and you can obviously zoom in at a more granular level or look at this in a more, more holistic. But again, looking at things from an access adoption and a use standpoint, under the access layer, we actually have a platform where you can see where fiber optic connectivity is available, where you can look at cable broadband as a technology transmission type and 
where, where it, uh, it currently exists, where there's DSL availability from uh, a telephone company, fixed wireless capability. Doesn't look like there's much fixed wireless in Nashville. So, um, and then finally, mobile broadband, uh, the 3G, 4G networks uh, that you've mentioned. Uh, we also have an unserved household density layer. And these are gonna show areas where there is not a wireline connection available. And it's gonna shade those, those census blocks by household density so that you can see where the, the higher concentrations of folks live that do not currently have access. There's a lot of other information here, including maximum advertised download speed layers. Uh, I do want to pan out and let you get a sense of that, because one thing I'm very proud of, uh, and I think some of my European friends may laugh a little bit, um, but uh, there are not many, very many places in the United States that have uh, one activity in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, as you may have seen in various international publications, is, is, is one of the first. And, and actually, uh, th th these maps are updated twice, uh, twice annually, and we just uh, up completed this update uh, in October. So this is not reflected on here yet, but Bristol, Tennessee actually just lit uh, one gig connectivity last month as well. Um, there are a lot of other cool tools on here. Um, you can search demographics. You can actually extract data if you're working on a research project and you need geofile or, or some other information. And one other layer I want to call your attention to is we also have information under the adoption front, including special promotions from certain providers. But under the use tab, you can also see community anchor institutions. So schools, libraries, healthcare facilities, public safety, government offices. You can see their locations and uh, information on the connectivity that's available uh, to those institutions. So I encourage you to uh, log on to connectedtm.org and uh, click on the interactive map and play around with this, take a look. It's got a lot of great functionality. Um, but to shift briefly back to the presentation, so if that's the supply side, I will ask you to think of the demand side. And this is just a quick snapshot from the, from the website. I won't delve into this too much, but this shows you some of the highlights from our, our business survey uh, from 2011 and some relevant information there. You can access all of the residential and business uh, research at connectedtn.org forward slash research. But moving on to the culmination of those two things in the community technology program, it's all about leveraging that supply side and demand side information to expand technology through informed action. And that includes benchmarks on the what we like to call the three pillars of broadband. So that's broadband access, broadband adoption, and broadband use. There are benchmarks under each of those that look at mobile connectivity, uh, middle mile access, uh, access to more robust speed tiers, and those all fall under access. <laughs> under adoption, you see things like uh, digital literacy training programs, uh, public computing centers, programs for vulnerable populations that may have difficulty learning or, uh, or owning technology <coughs> themselves. And then under use, there are benchmarks uh, that look at economic development and how the local economic development efforts are, being, are leveraging broadband technology to advance their communities, uh, as well as libraries, education, healthcare, government services, so on and so forth. So I'd finally like to shift gears and just uh, highlight a little bit on that policy front. I mentioned the Connect America Fund and FirstNet. Um, you probably can't read this, but I'll show you that this, the, on the right side there, this large, uh, almost half of pie, that's about $4.6 billion annually that uh, is being allocated to the new Connect America Fund. There are various phases that have been laid out for that. Um, we've already passed phase one for the mobility fund. 
we're currently in a phase where uh, incumbent providers were given an option to take a standard subsidy to build out to the unserved households in their uh, in their areas. Um, and those that did not choose to accept that subsidy, those areas will now go to a reverse auction uh, where companies can bid uh, to, uh, to, to come in and provide that service at, at, at the lowest subsidy rate. So lots of great information available at the FCC site, obviously, as well as the Connected Nation site. Um, helpful links there, again, there's the Connected Tennessee website, as well as Connected Nation. For those of you who are particularly interested in, in policy or the national level, uh, there's a lot of great information on the Connected Nation side. It's not available on Tennessee side, but I would encourage you to check out both of those links. Um, and, and finally, I'd just like to uh, conclude by addressing a couple of those items that, that I mentioned earlier on where, um, where some things are going in the future. Uh, Connected Nation is part of uh, the Global Center for Connected Campuses. Uh, and recently hosted uh, a technology uh, policy event uh, related to the vice presidential debate that was held at Center College. Um, so that's, that's some, some interesting uh, evolution in the higher education space and a partnership that we're proud to be a part of. Um, the, uh, another interesting thing that I'm spending a lot of my time on right now is one-to-one uh, -one technology in the public education space and the public schools in, in Tennessee. Uh, specifically, we're working closely with the Metro Nashville Public Schools uh, as they seek to identify ways to get a personal technology device into the hands of every student in their school system uh, and also have an integrated uh, network architecture that supports learning through that type of an environment. Um, frankly, it's a challenge and, and I commend them for recognizing that one size will not fit all uh, in this space. Uh, there are um, sadly some areas where if the school system were to provide at no cost a, 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 a tablet or an iPad or a laptop to a student, uh, that student might take that uh, device home that evening and, and see it sold on the street the next day by a parent or relative or, or, a, or a sibling. Um, so everything from that just to the basic cost for low income families to be able to access those devices they're looking at a multi-tier approach, um, but the, I guess the way I've uh, looked at this is, you know, at one point in time, the abacus was an innovation at education, uh, educational instruction, and then later the chalkboard, and later the textbook. So as we move forward, it's going to be some point in history where in the public education space, if each student doesn't have their own technology device that's being utilized in a real time, uh, fashion with programs, uh, utilizing algorithms to, to devise customized individual learning plans uh, based on their uh, proficiency levels demonstrated in near real-time form. There's going to be a big history where we look back on schools that don't have that as being a stone age. Uh, the question is how we help diverse metropolitan school district and rural school districts with funding challenges here in, in, in the United States, uh, how we help integrate that type of technology into, into the educate space. So, um, Corey, I, I, I can have, have, to, to, I can have to hold you on also out there, Corey. Those are is that you're really looking at. Um, <laughs> and uh, promise going. Thanks very much. Sorry, was there? Thanks very much, Corey. I'm going to hold you on that thought, and uh, we're going to uh, save some time for discussion at the end. Uh, but Chris, I'm going to pass it over to you now. Uh, thanks again, Corey. And uh, so we've got Chris Condor on from B4RN in the UK. Hi, I'm Jess Simon. I'm the UK That's been very interesting listening to those two people. I suppose I've been quite boring after that because I'm just a farmer's wife um, and I live in a very rural area in the UK, in North <coughs> Lancashire. Um, I'm part of a group called BAM, Broadband for the Rural North, and we set up um, a couple of years ago because we realised nobody was going to help us. Um, the government can't help us because uh, they don't see the need. I think they believe the telcos will do it all for us. 
and they haven't got lots and lots of money, and it would take lots and lots of money to fibre up the rural areas. But we've hit upon a plan ourselves where we can do it for ourselves. That's what our company is. So we're not actually building the network for the people. We are enabling the people to build the network for themselves. And we're going to provide a, a gigabit fibre to every single property in the initial eight parishes that we started with. Um, the research we did, we didn't have uh, interactive maps and everything, we just had interactive people who <laughs> found <laughs> from their own communities. I mean, I know it's not very efficient. I mean, what we're doing isn't efficient. It's just the way we've decided to do it. We're doing it for ourselves. We haven't got any funding uh, at all. And so we had to get some money to build this network. And the way we went about it, we decided we, we had lots of meetings with the parish councils, with the parishes, to find out which parishes were interested and which weren't. And we, we had planned this network that was going to be big enough to be sustainable. So we have to be able to wipe our faces and stand on our own two feet or, or we're wasting our time. It would be lovely if we did get some funding. That would mean we'd build it faster, but we haven't done so, that's that. Um, so what we did is we said to the people, if you will buy shares in our company, um, we can buy all the equipment we need to build this network. And if you will actually build it, we don't have to pay you know, all these people, we can build this ourselves. It's not rocket science. And so everybody had a think about it, and we asked them if they would register an interest. So if they would take a service from us, we told them it would be £30 a month for a gigabit fibre feed, and they could put the phone lines through it, as many phone lines as they wanted, they can watch the television through it, they can get whatever services they like through it for £30 a month. If they would register their interest in that, committing to take a service, but not lawfully committing, just saying, yes, we will do it. Um, if we got 50% of the people in the eight parishes, uh, then we would go ahead and launch the share issue. And we got our 50%, so we launched the share issue. We said to the people, if, if enough people buy £200,000 worth of shares, this network takes nearly two million to build, if, if enough people will buy £200,000 worth of shares as a sign of faith in the, in the company, that will give us enough money to buy the ducting to build the entire core of the network through the eight parishes. And we gave them a deadline of um, uh, the 28th of February, leap year day, 29th of February, sorry. And um, by that day, they'd raised, raised £300,000 in shares. So we said, oh, right, well, we're going to have to build it now because we've raised the money. So we bought all the ducting uh, and we started making little films about it and putting it on our website so that everybody was kept informed of what we were doing. I think a lot of people thought we were doing it just for publicity and showing off, but we weren't. What we try to do is keep the community uh, as informed and engaged in what they're doing as we can because it, it's them who's doing it it's not the barn it's not a mythical company doing it all for them it's the people themselves and so what we did is we bought rolls and rolls of this stuff this duct in and this is what we're laying and it's got the separate ducts in so this is like the main core duct in and then two go off that way and one goes off that way and, and this is how we build it so the farmers have been laying this, and where the farmers have been laying it, that's fine. You show them what to do, and you get on and do it. Um, where the community's been laying it, they haven't got the natural skills of the farmers, so somebody goes along and shows them what to do. But what we've, what we've actually found is, once you've shown a few people in the community how to do it, they just go ballistic, and they start laying it everywhere and connecting everybody and ordering more ducting and it, it's just taken off you know it's just fantastic to see how you've been able the community to do what they're doing uh, and like i say it's not rocket science it's like central heating so 
this is the stuff that goes into the house. And, and, and all it is, it's plug and play. So you just shove it in together like that. And, and that's a joint made. And, and that is it. That's as simple as that. So we get this. Oh, this I'm sorry, this is very funny. It's just <laughs>
villages themselves? Did you have to dig up streets or get permission to use rights of way as opposed to going through farmers' fields? And did you have any um, concerns from the actual industry that doesn't think people can do their own thing about whether you could do that? Um, we could go entirely in, in farmers' fields. Every one of our villages is tiny and it's surrounded by fields, so we go through the fields. If we get a place where it's easy to go through the gardens, we'll actually go from one garden to another garden to another garden. If we get a block of houses like cottages in a row, instead of coming up everybody's garden, one neighbour will say, well, if you, if you want to come up my garden down that side there, if you bring four ducks, I'll take it along the front of my garden and, and we'll bring it into your houses that way. And they, they form together these little clusters where they think, think think it through for themselves. It, it, you can't make a plan for 200, uh, 2,000 houses and get it all right. So you give them a rough idea where the main duck's yeah. going to go and let them come up with their own personal solutions. Way leaves, everybody has to give free way leaves. If somebody won't give way leaves, you don't get a connection. It's as simple as that, and we go around them. There's not very many of those. I think it's just one. One farmer who just really just wants on his land, but it's not a problem. We actually save quite a lot of money by avoiding him. So, <laughs> <laughs> the land, the land, the land grows community, and we've also got it's a bit like the Dukes of Hazard some days, where there's a feud going on between this farm and that farm, and he says, "Well, you're not going through my farm if you're going to get to his farm." But you say, sort it out for yourselves. Either you both cooperate, and either of you get it, and we go around and both. But they sort it out. The communities have more brains than you give them credit for. If you bring the service to them and, and make it easy for them to get onto it, they will do it. It's when they can't think of it for themselves. A community can't design a, ne a, net, a fiber network and build it themselves. But working together, they can be enabled to do it. And this can be replicated. I don't exactly know how, and I don't want to replicate it because we haven't been building this yet. But, um, you know, this is a model that can scale. Great, thanks very much. Uh, any other questions in the room here? Thank you. I have a question for Corey. Uh, very interested in your interactive mapping process. One of the questions I have when we do mapping in Alberta is we have some challenges approaching the ISPs in terms of divulging some of their coverage information. And I'm wondering, do you have any words of wisdom as to how you encouraged your ISPs to, to come up with uh, coverage data that was publicly available, to make it available publicly? Sure. Uh, well, I, I think, at least in the States, a lot of it has to do with, with structure. And frankly, that's why we are an independent, nonprofit organization that works in public-private partnership. Uh, because many, you know, they're, they're the general federal uh, freedom of information uh, components, and various states have their own laws. Uh, Montana, for example, uh, um, open access to records is, is stipulated in their state constitution. Um, so they're having a tremendous time uh, collecting uh, sensitive information from providers. What we do as a third party entity is we offer a non disclosure uh, to them that offers certain protections that they feel comfortable. And, and I will say that at this point, because we have been working with not all, but some of these providers uh, for a decade, uh, they've, they've built a sense of trust and rapport. They, they know that they can that they can trust us with their with this very you know, sensitive, competitive information uh, that would be exploited by their competitors on if it if it were to reach the open market or be posted on WikiLeaks or something like that. Um, so what we do is offer a non-disclosure process where we don't display the specific provider's coverage er area or their, the specific provider's speed tier offerings. We take that information and we aggregate it together so that you can see access at different platform levels. Um, so you can still see the granular access information, both the type of service from the technology transmission perspective and the speed availability. And we'll list that provider among the others if there, if there uh, is service 
uh, that they're offering there, but we don't call that specific provider's network or their uh, the, the or, or offer information on how robust that network is or is not. Uh, so that pro provides some protection from uh, you know. Uh, their opponents taking advantage of that and, and the commercials that we're bombarded with uh, every evening when we flip on the television. Um, so that's our process for provide, instilling that confidence, protecting sensitive data, but also putting it out there in a publicly accessible way where it can be benef uh, beneficial to consumers and policymakers alike. Great, thanks very much. Already. Hi, it's uh, Helen Hambly from the University of Guelph. And um, I, my question is actually to any of the three of you, but it was really uh, uh, sparked by Anne Marie's comment that uh, Finland has some, at least anecdotal evidence, uh, if not uh, a clear sense that people are remaining in the rural areas because of the, the access to broadband. And um, I think, Corey, you mentioned something too about the economic benefits uh, to, uh, to your region as well. So just wondering if the three of you could, could uh, speak to that, because that seems to be that those success stories and those that evidence is is what the decision makers are looking for uh, here in Ontario around why should we see this move up from say being fifth priority for our communities or even tenth priority for our communities to number one. Thanks. And Maria, I don't know if you might have. Okay. A well, yeah, I can I can give a short comment. Uh, like I mentioned, yes, we we had lot of feedback from city mayor saying that they have been uh, contacted by, by, for example, um, retiring people who have lived in in Helsinki for their life for the whole, for their whole lives, and now they want to come back home, kind of to say, and also young people who want to do remote work and still they want to grow their children in um, uh, safe environments, little villages. So yeah, we, we do have a lot of cases. And actually, uh, there's a really interesting study made by uh, um, a company in Stockholm in Sweden. In, uh, as you probably know, Sweden is one of the um, leading countries in fiber to the home networks. And in Stockholm, I can actually give you the link later on. Um, there is a socio-economic study being made, which is first in the whole world, and it's going to be uh, presented in United Nations um, meeting. And it's done by two Swedish guys in Stockholm. And it really gives rough evidence on on socioeconomic impact, not only what the customers have, but what how do the regions, um, what do the regions get from the network as a whole? It's going to be really, really interesting, and I will, um, I will share you the link, and then the guys in, in your end can share it with you, the rest of the audience. Yes, we'd be happy to do that, Anne Marie. If you can share that with us, we'll forward okay. that to the delegates. Uh, Corey or Chris, any comments on uh, resident attraction and retention and economic impacts from, from broadband? Yes, I, I've got a comment to make on that, if I can jump in first. Um, Please, we, ladies, we ladies first. <laughs> ladies first. <laughs> uh, we find that uh, we started our Wi-Fi project way back when because we were losing businesses, so businesses were leaving our area because they couldn't get an internet connection. And so we managed to retain several rural businesses simply by giving them a Wi-Fi service. And that's how come we're migrating now, because we know that Wi-Fi service is just not going to cut it for much longer. We can't increase our fee, and so this is why we've moved on to the fibre, and we're leasing the dark fibre. And we will also be open access, and we will also resell it to give other Wi-Fi networks in our area who we can't reach yet because we can't do everything uh, a Wi-Fi feed that's affordable. So we'll enable lots of other community Wi-Fi meshes to continue as well. And so we see it as not losing these people in the first place. We see it as getting the university students back home in the holidays because a lot of them won't come home because there's no decent connection once they get home. So they don't choose to return at Christmas and holidays. 
and if they know it's a decent connection at the parents' village or home or whatever, when they finish the university education, they'll say, well, we can actually get a better connection and live in a beautiful area, so we'll go home and we'll get the youngsters back that are leaving in droves. Thank you. Thanks very much. And, and Corey? Absolutely. Um, I think there, there are three components. There's the industrial plant component, there's the marketing component, and then there's the telework component, uh, which, which there's been some reference to. Uh, we've done a lot of work in conjunction with the Tennessee Department of Economic and Community Development to help them understand areas where there is a certain type of connectivity for some of their economic development projects, including industrial site, park locations, as well as recruiting companies who are looking at more at teleworking opportunities. Um, from the market standpoint, I would say that our business research, uh, and again, I'd steer you to the website to take a look at that, uh, indicates that businesses with broadband in Tennessee report average uh, median uh, revenues of uh, $400,000 per year, whereas businesses without broadband only report revenues uh, of $100,000 a year. When you look at small businesses, it's $200,000 uh, for those with broadband compared to $100,000 for those with not. So there's a direct benefit to those businesses who are using uh, the internet to either interface with their customers or market their products. Uh, and finally, on the teleworking space, uh, we actually have a teleworking report that's available, a white paper that's available for download on the website. And it indicates that uh, the average Nashville area employee who, uh, if they were to telework full time, would save $2,300 per year in uh, transportation costs from driving into uh, an office as opposed to staying at home. And, that, and from an environmental standpoint, that would also save uh, just under uh, a thousand, or excuse me, just under 10,000 pounds of, of less CO2 emissions from that individual employee as well. So they're not only benefit, uh, business benefits uh, and employment benefits, but they're also environmental benefits to, to having access to the technology.